the title really tells it all. It was the, the girls and women who went out to India, particularly in the time of the Raj, in search of husbands. It was a 300-year migration wow. of young girls and women to India and a great chunk of our social and cultural history that has never been written about until now. And how old were these girls then? When the fishing fleet first began, which was in the mid-1600s, some of them were only 16. These were usually orphans or girls who were very poor who didn't have a hope of making a good marriage in England because there was nobody to, no parents to give them a ball or to see that they met the right man. And they were actually sent out by the East India Company mm. and um, fed and clothed for a year, during which time they were supposed to find husbands because there were all these young men working for the East India Company and the, the, they were, there were far more men than women and so usually they were flooded with proposals, showered I perhaps should say with proposals. <laughs> Lucky them. Lucky them, <laughs> exactly. And those who were too plain or too unpleasant or too badly behaved for even the most desperate company man were sent home under the rather unfortunate title of Returned Empties. Oh, no, how awful. Can, I, can I'm just trying to imagine going all the way there. And the journey itself must have been quite long and arduous. The and journey was absolutely horrendous. It never took less than about five months. You went out in one of these little cockle shell sailing boats, a few, we call them cockle shells, a few hundred tons only. And one of the problems of that was that seasickness was of a virulence and duration that I don't think any of us have ever experienced mm. because most of us fly and those who do go in ships usually it's quite large and they have stabilizers but then it was a real real problem mm. you took your larder with you uh, and its moves bars clucks and snorts gradually diminished as it got eaten mm -hmm. very often there was a shortage of water you went round the cape of good hope you couldn't very often go near land because of pirates and so with the um, effluvia from the animals and no water to clean up the cabins or yourself, I can only ask you to imagine the stench and the discomfort. Yes, yes. And what, what drew you to actually want to write about this, this part of history? I heard the name, several people mentioned it, and they either said, oh yes, the fishing fleet, and knew all about it, or they said, the fishing fleet? You mean you're going to write about the Cod Wars? And so I started to research it. And I discovered that here was this great chunk of history mm. that nobody had ever written about before. And of course, to any writer, that's gold dust. Mm, absolutely. So when the women arrived in India, there were parties and the hunting and dancing and excitement uh, as these husbands were chased. I mean, you said there were more men than there were women. <laughs> so how was it for the, for the men themselves? Was it like Christmas come early? <laughs> well, naturally, whenever there was a cargo of fishing fleet girls, they were... Um, enormously interested in yes. him whizzing down. But once the Raj started, which was in 1858, and we get the Indian Civil Service and we get the rules that stem really from the government, the Indian Civil Service, the men, who were, they were the prize catches, mm. but they were not allowed to marry till they were 30, which was a great check on them. And it was the same really in the army. Anybody in government service had to marry late. They were supposed to work their apprenticeship mm. and be ready to go anywhere at any time probably on horseback. And if you were traveling around like an ICS man in uh, different parts of the jungle, going from camp to camp, living on a horse, really, and all your belongings in, packed up and taken with you, mm. you couldn't take a wife and children mm. with you. You had to be available. And I'm just wondering, though, with the euphoria of obviously meeting the right man and getting married, and that must be magical for all these ladies who went over there, but what was the actual married life like once the marriage, you know, the, the wedding was taken, has taken place? One of the things depended enormously on where your husband worked. Mm. If he perhaps worked in one of the large cities, maybe, or maybe he was a magistrate in a good station, or if you married a soldier, in a cantonment, if you married a soldier, uh, officer in a cantonment, uh, you would have all his fellow officers and a lot of their wives. You would have people to talk to. You would have polo matches to watch. You would have a good time, usually. Mm. And uh, certainly, if you married somebody who lived in a fairly large centre, you'd have a very busy social life. Some people married forest officers who lived miles away. Well, if you were somebody who liked wildlife... Uh, particularly if you were somebody who liked birds. India was a paradise for birds, the most beautiful birds practically you've ever seen. And they were very, very interested indeed. A lot of these girls loved that. If you were a painter, uh, you could 
you needed an interest, mm. really, if you were living in an isolated spot. Yes, yes. And did some of these ladies also marry the locals? No, in a word. This happened during the time of the East India Company, but it was the men who married the locals. But okay. That was very much accepted because of the difficulty of going out there. Very few English women went out there. Mm. And you had all these men. Uh, what, what did they do for women? The answer was liaison with the Indian women, and some of them married them. Mm, I'm just thinking, how do the women even cope with the change of environment? I mean, it's very hot <coughs> over there. And also the, the chance of being bitten by mosquitoes as well. The great thing about India was the terrible deadly diseases, mm. which w w really, till we got antibiotics, and that was after the time of the Raj, um, you took your chances. Mm. Do you know, if you were bitten... All in the name of marriage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think any of us realised just what a powerful impulse yeah. that was. Because mm. in Victorian times, if you didn't marry, if you were a spinster, uh, your life was not really, unless you were a rich young woman, worth living. Because you didn't have a house, you didn't have a husband, you didn't have children, you had no establishment. Yes. That was the thing. Victorian society was really predicated on marriage. Mm. Now, your book catalogues the endless, often unspoken rules that governed everyday life. Um, can you tell us about some of the attitudes and moral codes that, I suppose, were so closely regulated? Well, the Raj was absolutely riddled with protocol. I mean, one of the first things... Well, I actually interviewed three fishing fleet girls. They were in their 90s, um, brilliantly alert and mm. bright. And... One of them told me the first thing when I went to stay with my aunt and uncle in Madras, the first thing they did was say, now we've got to get you some calling cards. You dropped cards on everybody and that showed there you were. Without doing that, you were almost a non-person. Mm. All the young men would leave cards on the married couples. They would then get asked to dinner. You did it and you went and signed the governor's book. So when the governor had his annual garden party, you got asked. It was a very stiffly reg regulated society like that. There was even something called the Warrant of Precedence, which listed uh, everyone from the top down in government service, 93 different positions, from the viceroy right down to the assistant deputy opium collector, <laughs> so that people knew exactly where to seat people. And... Women took their status from their husbands. Mm. I suppose much like today, isn't it? Women taking their status from, from well, their husbands? No, sometimes there are plenty of occasions today where uh, the wife is a, a high earner. Yes, or has, yes. Uh, you know, yes. And you say, and, oh, you say uh, oh, he's married to her. Mm, mm. I'm thinking more actually <coughs> in, the, in the African culture oh, I see. where I'm from. Yeah, women still take the yes. status from the husbands, yes. even though they could really? be higher earners. It's a very strange thing. That well, is. in England, this country, it's, it's not the same. No, really, is it? no, no. So well, women have often been invisible or marginal in the counts of the British Empire. In what ways do you think focusing on their experiences can offer up fresh insights into this historical period? Well, I think we did an awful lot of work that was fairly unsung. You're quite right, they were invisible in terms of government. I mean, there was no woman in any form of government there, but uh, hospitals would have been lost without a lot of... Uh, British nurses used to go out, uh, women doctors, because in the Indian culture, a woman could not be seen by a male doctor, so that if you had a female doctor, so that they undoubtedly saved a lot of lives there, mm. and they educated people, they would help build schools, uh, uh, they would do all that kind of thing. They would visit the wives. And they created, really, a, a civilizing influence. And as one of the men I quote in my book says, it is not natural. He was one of the early young ICS men. He said, I have been almost five years without even hearing a female voice. Oh, wow. And this is abnormal. Mm. Mm. You see, there was that. Yes. They were help meets and companions, largely. Yes. In all the, the research you did, what stood out for you? I think what stood out for me was the spirit of... There were these girls, very often very young, perhaps from a quiet English village, um, where they'd grown up in a rather uneventful way. They go out to India. They might easily marry somebody who did not live in... Um, a metropolitan social circle who lived somewhere far away, it, they had this spirit of just get on with it. Mm. Uh, you know, plague, as in one case, might break out almost at the bottom of the garden. Did they panic? No. The girl who, uh, I wrote about where this did happen, and uh, everyone said, you must leave, you must leave. And she said, 
Well, if a rat falls dead from the rafters, I'll go then, but I won't otherwise. (laughs) And thank you so much for joining us on Jazz FM.